Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. Today we're going over the 2025 Microeconomics FRQ. This is set one. This is an unboxing video. That means that the questions were released very recently, just a couple hours ago. I've gone through and done my best to figure out what I think the best answers are, or at least what the rubrics are likely to show. Um, just so you know, I, I don't work for the College Board, although I do grade AP exams. Uh, so I don't know for sure what will be accepted and what won't be accepted, uh, but these are my best guesses. So let's go ahead and jump into it. See what we got. Before we get into it though, I wanna thank everybody for subscribing to ReviewEcon.com and, uh, and watching the videos and buying the review booklet. I really appreciate the support. Uh, anyways, let's, let's get into it. Let's see what uh, the questions were and what I think the answers are. So first of all, uh, the first question, we have uh, Voda Reservoir. They're a profit maximizing firm. They are the only producer, so that means they're going to be a monopoly in the country. They are, uh, and they're currently earning negative economic profit. So first thing we have to do is draw the graph for this monopoly. Uh, and here it is, there it is. So uh, we have the downward sloping demand curve with marginal revenue below. We have the MR equals MC quantity labeled QM. The price is found at the demand curve up above. Our ATC is up above the price quantity point there on that demand curve. And we also have to shade in the area of dead weight loss. As you can see, it's that triangle right there. And if you have all that, you're gonna get yourself a few points. All right, I'm not, I'm not figuring out the great, the point breakdown here, but the whole thing will be worth 10 points for this entire uh, uh, question. All right, let's move on to the next part. The second thing we have to do, it says, uh, suppose the government requires Voda Reservoir to produce the socially optimal quantity of bottled water on our graph that we already drew. We have to show that socially optimal quantity of, bo of bottled water and label it QS. So the uh, allocatively efficient or socially optimal quantity is found where the demand intersects that marginal cost curve. Go ahead and find that demand equals marginal cost as you drew it and head on down and mark that quantity QS. All right, over on to part C. We have to suppose that instead the government grants a per unit subsidy for Voda Reservoir and what would happen to Voda Reservoir's profit maximizing quantity of bottled water and we have to explain for my answer here, here we go. I say it's going to be an increase because the per unit subsidy will cause the firm's marginal cost to shift downward and that results in a higher MR equals MC quantity. I think you're gonna to have to ref reference that marginal cost shifting in order to get this point along with saying that increase. All right, on to part, uh, on to part D now. Uh, suppose that new producers have entered the bottled water market at Voto Reservoir. Uh, they continue to operate the uh, bottled market, wa bottled water market. Uh, will the demand for uh, Voter Reservoir's bottled water uh, become more elastic, less elastic, or stay the same as new producers enter the market? So as new producers enter the market, we should expect that they're going to be offering substitutes. And the more substitutes we have, the more elastic the demand is going to be. So there's my answer, more elastic. All right, over on to part E. Voter Reservoir hires workers in a perfectly competitive labor market. If the demand for bottled water increases, what will happen to Voter Reservoir's demand for labor? And we have to explain. So here's my answer. I'm not exactly sure how high the bar is going to be in order to get this point, but here's what I get here, or here's what I have here. Increase because the demand for labor is a derived demand you may or may not have to say that. And the increase in demand for bottled waters, uh, bottled water will increase the price and marginal revenue. I don't know if you have to mention the marginal revenue or not. Uh, and with that, the marginal revenue product of Voter Reservoir's labor will also increase. I didn't end up including in my answer uh, the, the formula for marginal revenue product. It's the marginal revenue times the price, or excuse me, times the marginal product. Uh, marginal revenue times marginal product. Uh, I don't know if you'll need that. Maybe I left it out and lost myself a point there, but I think that will probably get the point. Hopefully it does. All right, here's the next part for, uh, for EII. The government implements a new regulation that increases the minimum age required for a worker to be employed in the bottled water factory. What will happen to the market wage in the short run? And we have to explain. So here's my answer for that. Increase because the supply of workers who are able to work will decrease, so it's a decrease in the supply and the labor market, which increases the equilibrium wage. All right, so I think as long as you have that supply decrease in the labor market, you're gonna be good. All right, on to the second question. Uh, we have a graph that's provided with us. This is the market for rice in Rushland. 
and we have to calculate the economic surplus at the market equilibrium and show our work. So the market surplus, remember, is both the consumer surplus and the producer surplus added together. It's gonna to be that giant triangle right there. Calculate the area of that triangle. It has a height of nine from 10 to one, and it has a base of 60 units. So go ahead and calculate that area, show your work, 10 minus a dollar, that's nine or $9, times 60 times one half equals $270 worth of economic surplus. On to part B, if the government sets a price floor at $3 per bushel, will there be a surplus, a shortage, or neither? And we have to explain. So here we go. I say neither because the price floor is below equilibrium, which makes it ineffective. All right, this was a tricky one. This is a tricky one. Hopefully you saw that the uh, price floor was in the wrong spot or ineffective because price floors, if they're going to be effective, are up high or ab above equilibrium. All right, on to part C. Suppose that instead of the price floor, Rushland engages in international trade and the world price of five dollars per and the world price is five dollars per bushel. Will Rushland export or import rice? And we have to explain using numbers from the graph. Uh, it's make sure you use these numbers, otherwise you might not get the point. But here's my answer. So, by the way, first I'm going to draw in what that would look like on the graph. So at five dollars, we can see that the quantity demanded is going to be fifty but the quantity supplied will be 80. Since the quantity supplied is greater than the quantity demanded, we don't have a surplus. We're actually going to export the difference. So here's my answer, exports, uh, or ex it should be export, but you know, typo, I don't think it'll cost me the point there. Uh, exports because, export because the $5 world price is above the $4 domestic equilibrium price, 80 bushels will be produced, 50 bushels will be consumed, and the difference, 30 bushels, will be exported. I know I have a lot of numbers in that answer, and I use those numbers because it tells me to use numbers in my answer. I don't know if you'll need all of those or if just some of them will be uh, except be needed, but I tried to use every number I could because that's what it asked for. It asked me to use numbers. So I always try to go uh, make sure I hit that hit that bar wherever they reach it or wherever they put it. All right? if, you, if they lower the bar, you might not need as much. All right, on to the next part. For part C double I, uh, we have to calculate the consumer surplus when Rushland engages in international trade, and we have to show our work. So I drew the triangle in there. That is the triangle of consumer surplus. It's at the $5 until we get to the quantity of 50, and then everything above to the demand curve. Calculate the area of that and show your work. We have a height of five and a base of 50. There we go. So 10 minus $5, that's a height of five, times 50 times one half gives us $125 worth of consumer surplus. On to part C, triple I, we're going to calculate the total revenue that Rushland's farmers will earn at the world price and show our work. There you go, there's that rectangle there of total revenue that's going to be earned. Remember total revenue is the price times the quantity. The domestic producers are producing 80 units and they are selling them at $5 a piece. So multiply that out, $5 times 80, $5 times 80 that is, and that it gives us $400 worth of total revenue for these farmers. All right, on to question number three. This is a uh, payoff matrix. This is game theory. I'm not gonna read the entire paragraph there. It's a standard game theory question. We've got two entities or two firms, uh, Bitly's bracelets and Tony's trinkets. Uh, Tony can uh, do either unique or typical, and Bitly can do either uh, uh, gold or or silver right so first part we have to do oh and all the numbers there are remember profits so it's a standard question as it typically is all right so we've got first thing we have to it says suppose that bitly's bracelets chooses to produce silver jewelry uh, is choosing unique jewelry the best choice for tony's tr trinkets and we have to explain using numbers so we're in that column right there uh, because that is the column where bitly's bracelets uh, chooses to produce silver jewelry. And that means that in that column, we have Tony's Trinkets is considering to earn, uh, earning $20 in profit or $21 profit. Since $21 is greater than $20, that means that Tony's Trinkets is going to be better off doing typical jewelry. So that leads us to our answer here, typical because $21 is less, or $21 is greater than $20. And if you have that answer, I think you're going to get yourself a point there. All right. I'm going to leave that star there as we move forward so we can use it later in future answers because that's one of the choices we need to solve for the Nash equilibrium 
or equilibria as this case is. All right, moving forward. So the next question, it says, uh, is Bitly's bracelets dominant strategy to produce gold jewelry, uh, to produce silver jewelry, or do they not have a dominant strategy? And we have to explain using numbers from the payoff matrix. So let's go ahead and see what Bitly's bracelets is going to do. Uh, if they think Tony Strinkets is going to do unique jewelry, then they are choosing between, then Bitly's bracelets is choosing between $21 of profit or $19 of profit. I'm gonna go ahead and put a star there at the $21 of profit. They're going to choose gold in that case if Tony's Trinkets does, uh, does unique products. And if, let's move ahead and go down to what if Tony's Trinkets does typical jewelry, then Bitly's Bracelets is choosing between $7 and $16. And here, $16 is the better choice. And that means since they, in one case, are going to choose gold jewelry in the other case, they're going to choose silver jewelry. That means they do not have a dominant strategy, but we have to explain using the numbers from the choices that we just went over. So there's our answer. No, because $21 was greater than $19. That was our second choice we looked at. And $16 is greater than $7. And those were the numbers we looked at to make those choices. All right. Moving on to C, identify the Nash equilibria or identify all Nash equilibria for this game. Well, we don't. We, we still have one more choice we haven't looked at. So that last choice that we still need to figure out where, if there's a second Nash equilibria, equilibrium, uh, let's go ahead and look at that. Uh, that's for this column right there. This is where Bitly's bracelets is choosing gold. We need to decide what Tony's trinkets would do in that case. There we go. They're choosing between $15 and $10 of profit. In that case, $15 of profit is clearly better. And so there we go. Those are all of our stars. We have two Nash equilibria there. Those are the two quadrants with, with two stars in this case. Um, if either one, if they are in one of those quadrants and with those actions, if they're acting in, in those spots, then either firm changing what they do uh, unilaterally on their own, then that means that, that company will be worse off. So that's the definition of a Nash equilibria there. So let's go ahead and, uh, go ahead and identify them. Our first one is Bitly's bracelets chooses uh, produces gold, while Tony's trinkets produces unique, and Bitly's bracelets chooses silver, and Tony's trinket trinkets does typical. So those are our two Nash equilibria on this payoff matrix. Moving on to part D, suppose Tony's trinkets profit from producing typical jewelry increases regardless of what Bitly's bracelets does. What is the minimum amount? by which Tony's Trinkets profit must increase in order for typical jewelry to become a dominant strategy. Is it $2, $4, $6, or $11, or is it $15? So this question is really about this column right there. How do we get that star that's already there, that is uh, Tony's Trinkets choosing to be unique, how do we get them to move it down to typical? Because when uh, when Bitly's bracelets does silver, they're already doing typical. So that's why we just need to move one star over. And as you can see, they're making currently making fifteen dollars a profit. If they switch over, they will be making ten dollars profit. So what number there would get them to actually move over? Well, six dollars, eleven dollars, or fifteen dollars. Any of those would do it. But the minimum number there is the six dollars. So that's our answer there: six dollars. All right, moving on to part E. Suppose instead that these two firms now cooperate and they merge into one firm to maximize their combined profits. The new firm will have two locations and continue to face the same actions and payoffs. Calculate the new firm's maximum combined profit. This is just the monopoly outcome. We're just adding the total in, the, uh, in all of the quadrants and finding the place where it's the largest amount. So it's actually gonna be that quadrant right there where uh, Bitly's bracelets produces silver jewelry, Tony's trinkets produces unique jewelry, you add up those two uh, payoffs together, that's the $20 plus the $19. Show your work, of course. So $20 plus $19 equals $39. And that's the answer I've got there. All right, so, so there you have it. Those are the answers that I think are going to be accepted on this year's exam. I really appreciate all of your support. If you haven't done so already, I'd love it if you gave me a subscribe. I, even though I know you might be done with this class, I'd love love to keep the subscriptions going. I'd appreciate it. Uh, like the video if you or share it with somebody if you think it's going to be helpful. Uh, and let me know what you think. Do you like do you like my answers? Do you agree with my answers? Do you think they're best? Uh, whatever you think, put it down in the comments below. I'll do my best to comment or, or heart and heart your uh, your response. Uh, thank you very much again. You guys have a good uh, good luck on the macro exam if you're doing that one.
and I'll see y'all next time. Take care.